Welcome to Mystery Bible. My name is Ken Primus. I'm your host. We've been looking at Moses and his family. The last podcast, we looked at Miriam's dream. She had prophesied to her family about the birth of her brother. We saw Aaron's birth. We saw her, uh, Miriam's birth. So we are looking at this family and we've talked about how God uses family and he works with families. And, um, um, your family may be, um, as they say, you know, but I believe all families are dysfunctional. So you're, it's not just your family. So you can't claim that as if it's, um, you know, just yours. And I know many of you will talk about the degree of the dysfunctionality, the dysfunctionality within your family. Look, guys, every family is dysfunctional to a degree. And it doesn't matter. We shouldn't be competing about um, how dysfunctional one family is. But what we should all agree that God is able to work with dysfunctional family to get his will done on this earth, but also that he would bless his people as well. So um, in this podcast, what we're going to do is go back and forth. We are looking now after the prophecy of um, Miriam. We're looking as to what's happening within the family surrounding the birth and coming up to the birth of Moses. And so we're going to take a look at that. We're going to look at two sources today, the legend of the Jews, and we're going to oscillate back and forth with um, getting information also from Josephus. So uh, that's where we're at today. And so we're looking at, uh, we see that Joshua his uh, mother, and um, she's about to give birth. It tells us that Moses was a preemie. Uh, according to the legend of the Jews, it says that Joshua gave birth to the child six months after conception. So that's a premature baby, and we know that um, that is a common thing today because I know one of my child, um, one of my sons was born a preemie, and he happened to be the uh, tallest out of all my boys. So there you go. And I know many preemies that are much bigger than the normal kids, if you will. So uh, we see that um, he was, according to the legend of the Jews, he was born six months, okay? And um, tells us that uh, after six months that uh, um, she and the family hid him for three months after uh, after he was born. And let's take a look at some of the stuff that was happening around at that time and get a kind of picture. Because remember, we read that there was this decree about the men not, um, uh, that the babies would be killed and dr- drowned and, and all of this stuff, just warfare against the uh, Hebrew people. We know that... Uh, his father had separated, called the men to separate from the, the wives and so that they will not have any kids, so that, of course, he's trying to protect the people. But then after a little while, he had a conversation with his daughter, Miriam. Miriam tells him, hey, man, you can't do that. And um, he came back um, and he married, remarried his wife. And it tells us that she had grown old because of not having a physical uh, interaction with her husband. After they remarried, she became young. She was able to then get pregnant and have this baby. He, as I said, he's um, six months. Uh, she carried him and gave birth, hired him for three months. And then they began to set him free into the water, if you will. So what are we going to do? is get a chance to pick up. Uh, so that was a quick, if you will, a quick overview. So, um, so after he, after Miriam, the last po- podcast we looked at, she had in, in, you know, informed her dad about the, um, uh, that the child is going to be born and so forth. And it says, uh, when they had determined, uh, they had made an ark, uh, wrestled after the manner of a cradle and of the bigness sufficient for an infant to be laid in. Without being too straight, straightened, they then 
um, put all kinds of slime in the bag as they, I mean, in the, uh, the, to protect it from sinking, actually, this is what they're doing, so that it would float in the water and go forward and, um, not, you know, drown, drown. So after they put all the slime, kind of make sure that everything was okay, they send the guy off in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> no. Um, they pushed him uh, in and they just released him. And again, they are releasing this child by faith because they are believing that God will then take care of him. And so we see after they release him, you know, that um, Miriam begins to walk with him and to watch him. He says, but Miriam, the child's sister, passed along upon the bank over again uh, against him and her mother had bid her uh, the mom, of course, is, of course, you know, any mother you know, would want to make sure that their child is taken care of. And so the mother is telling her to do this. And so, uh, she takes off and she's now on the way to see where God, because God is going to be the one that is now in control. And so many of us you have, and I've talked about this and I've preached about this as well. There comes a time with our life when we have to allow God to take control. And uh, there's a great story in the Bible with Jesus Christ when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. So uh, we know that Jesus said that he does everything according to the will of the Father. What he sees the Father, that's what I do. And so we know that he is in the will of the Father because he sees him and he does what the Father does. Fathers, please. Jesus tells us that we ought to model ourselves after him. He tells us that Jesus Christ in us, we in him, and then we are in God. So it makes us this family. So your imperfection is perfected in Jesus Christ and in the Father. So uh, I want to go back to this principle now where one has to release everything into God. Because we, as human beings, we are concerned and we want to be in control. We are all control freaks, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. And then there's a point in time when you have to allow things to go out of your control, where you surrender it to someone. And we know that within a marriage, that is tested every day between a husband and a wife. Sometimes, you know, the wife, in her humbleness, has to release everything to her father, to her husband. That is why it's very important that you guys not be, um, you know, uh, uh, be uh, prideful when it comes to your wife. Honor her and um, understand what she's doing. She's relinquishing her everything and trusting in you. And that is a position of honor. And you should not be abusing that woman. You should honor her. Uh, because she is now uh, giving over to you her trust, her desire, everything. And she is in, entrusting you now to take it to that next level. And you, in turn, have to do the same to God. Now, you take it, the fact that this woman has done this and honor you in such a beautiful fashion, you need to honor her by taking it to God and having him give you the wisdom, the understanding, the uh, all the additional information that you don't have access to that he has access to within that situation so that you can move it forward and when she sees that you are a man that listens and, and is in obedience to God she will have no problem in surrendering to you as the head of the house and so that is how that relationship is supposed to be governed so now let's talk about this thing about Jesus Christ. We see that Jesus had to do the very same thing as Miriam's family had to do. And they had to release um, Moses into the hands of God for him to now guide the situation and become God of the situation as he promised that he would. And so let's see what the scripture says and then we'll go back to when Jesus had to do this within the Garden of Gethsemane. But Miriam, the child's sister, passed along upon the banks over against him as her mother had bid her to see whether the ark would be carried where God demonstrated that human wisdom was nothing but that the supreme being is able to do 
whatever he pleases, that those who, in order to their own security, condemn others to destruction and use great endeavors about, uh, about it, fail of their purpose, but that others are in a surprising manner preserved and obtain a prosperous condition almost from the very midst of their calamity. Those, I mean, who, whose danger arise by the appointment of God, and indeed such a provision uh, was exercised in the case of this child, has shown the power of God. And so we see that, that process is described there. So here we see Jesus Christ. He is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and it tells us that he is having a conversation with the Father. And that conversation is prayer. That's what prayer is. Prayer is your time of conversation with your father. If you are in love with someone, you would want to spend time. So here is Jesus spending time with the father. He's in conversation. And this conversation apparently is some deep stuff going on within this conversation. Jesus says, if it be possible, take this cup away from me because I don't want to die. I don't... and." I don't think it's the dying that he was uh, de talking about. I think it was the separation from his father that he was really praying about. He's like, take this away from me. I've never really been separated from you. I don't know what that means, how it feels like to be separated from you. And so those that are uh, that are feeling abandoned, going, uh, Jesus Christ knows how you feel because he felt abandoned by the Father. Now, he had a relationship with the Father from the beginning of time. And so, he had never been separated from his Father, ever, until he was on the cross. The scripture says that he became sin. So, when we, when the people were looking at Jesus Christ, and um, as uh, um, he was becoming sin, uh, the dark this begins to get darker. That a uh, powerful picture. You see the natural as well, as he is becoming sin, and then when he became sin, when he was the essence of sin, he turns to his father and he says, "My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me?" Because the Bible tells us that the father cannot look unto sin, and so the God who was separated from his son. So the father knows what separation feels like from a parent point of view, and Jesus knows what separation feels like from a child point of view. And so you guys that are, are, um, uh, are have separation within your family, and that's why I said Jesus Christ, the Bible says, is our high priest, and he's familiar with all the things that the human uh, being will go through, and so that when we have this, we come to this high priest, the scripture says in Hebrews, that he's familiar with us. He understands our need, our situation, and he goes to the Father and says, Hey, Dad, I know exactly how they feel, so we need to, um, you know, provide for it. So Jesus Christ surrendered. And when he surrendered, the Father took control, and because the Bible tells us that he was destined to die before the foundation of the earth. He was ordained for, for dying. And so the father took control of all of that. So all of the men that were doing what they were doing, they thought that they were crucifying Jesus Christ, not knowing that they were actually fulfilling the, uh, the word of God. So everything that he went through um, from that point on, uh, where it, it came into the garden, the betrayal, all of that stuff that man does, is simply, uh, and I keep telling you guys that we are on God's timetable. It's not that um, God is on ours. We are on his timetable. And so the Bible tells us that he's in control. And so when we think we are all bad and stuff like that, all these men that are doing the things that they're doing, um, God knows. He knows who you are. And so uh, we see then that God now is in control. You see that uh, Miriam is uh, watching because that's all you can do when you have given up control to God is to watch. And the Bible tells us how to, for us to watch. It says watch um, prayerfully. So 
as we begin to watch uh, what was happening with this family and this child is God is now taking control. And it says that uh, Timotheus uh, the, the, was the king's daughter. She is Pharaoh's daughter. And uh, so she's doing her thing with her people all day, all day long. And they had no uh, plan. They had no knowledge that they were going to run into this man. But God did because the Bible says that God had some plans. That he had made some plans for the Moses. And so um, God made plans for you and I. So this was one of God's plans for Moses being implemented and being carried, carrying out. You know, Theus was the king's daughter. She was not uh, diverting herself by the banks of the river and seeing a cradle born along the current. She sent some of her, uh, some that could swim, and bid them bring the cradle to her. When those that were sent on this errand came to her with the cradle, and she saw the little child, she was greatly in love with it, and on account of its largeness and beauty. So we know he was a handsome-looking boy. God had taken such good care in the formation of Moses that he caused him to be thought worthy of bringing up and providing for by all those that had taken the most fatal resolution on account of the dread of his nativity for the destruction of the rest of the Hebrews. When this happened, not to appear to be there on purpose, but only as standing to see the child. And she said, It is in vain that thou, O queen, callest for these women for the nourishing of the child. And that person we know is Miriam. Now Miriam was by uh, to it, but still, if thou wilt order one of the Hebrew women to be brought, perhaps it may... Ad- um, admit the breast of one of its own nation. Now, since she seemed to speak well, Demetheus bid her to procure such a one and to bring one of those Hebrew women to give this up. So when she had such authority given her, she came back and brought the mother who was, no, uh, was named I. So we know that uh, this family God is working with. And so uh, we know that, uh, let's see now, we're, we're still actually in, in Josephus. And we'll also oscillate back and forth as I tell you about the, um, in the uh, legend of the Jews. So we see that it was um, uh, Timotheus, who is the king's daughter. She was the one that gave him the name Moses. So let's take a look and see how that came about. She was now diverting herself, and we're looking at, and it says that um, she actually, um, his name is Mo. It says, uh, hereupon it was Timotheus imposed the name Moses um, upon him from what had happened when he was put into the river. For the Egyptian uh, called water by the name of Mo. And such as are saved out of it by the name of Uses, U-S-E-S. So by putting these two words together, they imposed his name upon him, and he was by the confession of all according to God's prediction. See, see guys, everything is according to God's prediction. So the Bible tells us that the hand of, the heart of the king is in the hand of God, and God moves it. even his name. Uh, they, um, God predicted that this would be his name and they named him and the reasoning by which they, uh, named him, God used that information by which that culture, that people, uh, their language, their custom, mo, meaning that's saved out of and uses, uh, those that are coming out of the water. Um, so we see that he is called Moses. Um, by God's prediction, as well for his greatness of mind, as for his uh, competence of um, Isaac, who was the son of Abraham. Now Moses' understanding 
became superior to his age, nay, far beyond that standard. And when he was taught, he discovered great quickness of apprehension that was unusual at his age. And his actions at that time promised greater when he should come to the age of a man. God did also give him the tallness when he was uh, but three years old, as it was wonderful, and as for his beauty, there was again upon seeing the child that they left, that they are about stood still in great. So we know that this guy, the handsome looking man, and that um, he is gifted by God in the sense where he's able to um, understand things at a faster rate than normal. And so we see then that God is over this man's life to uh, fulfill the word in his life. And so we see in the uh, legend of the Jews, we know that Jobed accordingly took um, an ark fashion from uh, Brussels, and this is in the legend of the Jews on their account. And we know that they give um, God, uh, they release the child in the water, and Pharaoh's daughter grabbed the child, and um, Miriam came in. So we see then that uh, God is in control, guys. I don't care what you think is going on. God is in control. And um, I did another study within uh, my my other podcast, um, Blueprint of Faith, where I talk about this for several weeks, um, about the will of God and um, having uh, the will of God. And then we talked about um, his timing and so forth. So everything that we do on this planet is about completing the will of God because he tells us that we are on a timeline. And that timeline is driven by God. Uh, within that man has his crazy behaviors, but the overarching um, completion of what God wants uh, uh, form as a society, as the world, all of those things. And then when you bring it down to the micro level, to your life and my life, he knows what we are all about because the scripture says that every man is naked before God in the sense that the word of God is able to divide asunder even the thoughts, uh, the intention of the thought. So when you and I stand before God on this planet, we are naked. And when we stand before him in the judgment day, we are naked. So um, he knows you, man. You think that you know you. God knows you more than you. So uh, we see then that uh, what we learned today basically was all of us have to come to a place by which we are going to um, be tested. We have to release um, the things that we want into God's hands. And I absolutely believe that what happens to us is the fearfulness that keeps you and I from releasing. Now, that wife is fearful to release and surrender everything to the husband because she has to trust him. So that's why I say to you, husband, if you're saved or not, honor her. Um, think about it, because she has to release all of that uh, concern now into you for you to go ahead and be the, come the head of the household and make that decision. A lot of Christians, Christian men, use this to subjugate the woman, but that's not what this is about. The Bible teaches us in Ephesians that the man and the woman have to be uh, one. They have to submit to one another in God. You can't submit to, to your wife um, in God and, and, and be lying and, and cheating and all that type of stuff. You can't. It's an honorable place to be that when you submit yourself and your wife submits to, to you in honor in God and you're submitting to God together, you are both naked before God and you're also naked before each other. Naked in the sense that she understands, she knows everything about you. You know everything about her. You're not hiding anything. And that's an honorable position. It's not a place to subjugate the woman. You are absolutely uh, sick if you're going to subrogate her at this level right here. This is where she is honoring you and giving you total respect and honor 
and you are going to subject subject her there, you're sick and evil. You need your mind fixed. You need to be fixed, bro. You are being given an honor, an honorable position by this woman. And so you want to um, be mindful of that. And when she does that, when she surrenders, you want to hold her and make her aware of the sacrifice that she's doing and that you are, you are mindful of that and you bow in her, to her in respect. And now you're going to take this, um, and go and seek wisdom before you do something. Seek wisdom. Search yourself before you make a decision after she's given you this privilege and honor. Um, uh, and she's now surrendering it to you. Give her the due that she deserves and stop being evil and um, destructive and being uh, one that lords over someone. That's not beautiful at all. Uh, when you serve someone, that's beauty, but it's also power. And so you want to show your woman how much you care and how much honor her and see what she does for you and in return. Give and it shall be given unto you. And so if you want honor, give her honor. You want respect, give her respect and see what this woman will do on uh, for you. I challenge any one of you guys that are out there because I know most of the audience that listen to uh, Mystery Bible are, are men uh, because I see the data. And so I want to challenge you guys. Um, honor your woman. Honor her. Um, uh, change your life by honoring her. Don't disrespect her because she has given you the, the place and don't usurp it and become an, a, a, an animal. You don't become an animal. Become one of statue, one of, of, of pride, not pride, one that is in love with your woman, one that is in, with respect and honor. That's the word I'm looking for. Be honorable with her and not be prideful. Prideful, the Bible tells us, before a fall comes pride. So don't be prideful. Give her honor and be honorable, and watch what she does. I really want to challenge you guys to do that. And so uh, we're going to begin uh, looking in the next uh, podcast about this child Moses. Now he's living in this family, and it's going to talk about him growing up within this family. What did he do? How did he happen? You know, uh, what was happening outside of of the palace, if you will, with the people, stuff like that, because there's a lot of things uh, according to these different sources that happen that is not in the Bible. And so we, again, we are looking at this particular uh, study outside of the Bible. We bring in the Bible as our baseline, and then we step outside. We look in the book of Jasher, uh, the book of, um, we look at the legend of the Jews, and other sources I also look at and I take notes and I put them together. And so I want to thank you, all of you again. I really, man, you have no idea how I do appreciate the gifts that you give me um, uh, uh, financially because I know the sacrifice that you are making. I was a single dad with four boys um, that were living with me. I have five sons and one was with their mom. Uh, so I understand the sacrifices that one makes to give an offering to people. Um, and I do appreciate, appreciate you. And I do pray for you that God will show you, uh, those that are not Christians that are just listening. I pray for you as well. I pray for my listeners. Um, it doesn't say if you're born again. I don't know if you are born again or not. Um, but what I do is pray for those that are following this podcast because prayer is good you know because everyone can use some prayer and i pray that god would give you guys wisdom and um and honor you so that you can honor others outside of your uh your family and your friends and so forth and so i want to thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, that of your sacrifice financially that you give to me and supporting um, me in the ministry so that I can um, continue to purchase all these books and do my studies so I can bring you some 
fun stuff. I like it in the name of Jesus. So we're going to continue. I think we're going to look at some of the things. There's some stuff that within these two sources that you and I are going to have some fun with. Um, it talks about Gabriel uh, rescuing Moses. It talks about um, uh, all kinds of different things within as this child is growing up and um, his infancy. So uh, we will have some fun as we began to extract additional information from uh, other sources so we can grow and become knowledgeable. And so uh, my purpose is so that you and I can learn who we are so we can, as I always say, change this world.